This is a very important sutta and is often used as a compulsory study for monks undergoing their uh, monastic education. This is unusual in that these are not the words of the Buddha. They are the words of Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta was one of the two chief disciples of the Buddha, Sariputta and Moggallana. Sariputta was regarded as second only to the Buddha in terms of his understanding and depth of knowledge. And he was given the title of Marshal of the Dhamma, Dhamma Sena Pati. He was highly uh, respected by the other monks, and the Buddha trusted him hugely. Sometimes the Buddha would just give a brief explanation of some point and then leave it to Sariputta to fill in the explanation in detail. For those of you who don't know his, his history, he was born in or near the city of Rajagaha into a well-to-do, well-respected Brahmin family. At the same time, same day that he was born, uh, another boy was also born to another well-known and respected Brahmin family. Uh, the man who became Sariputta was called Upatissa, and the other boy uh, was called Kolita. And they grew up as childhood friends. And they spent a lot of their time together, and When they became young men, they found that there was something lacking in their life, a lacking in sense of lacking meaning, lacking, lacking uh, uh, understanding, and they wanted to find themselves a teacher who could perhaps help them to understand things better. And they came upon a teacher called Sanjaya. And they listened to what Sanjaya had to say. He was a, um, a popular teacher. He had a large following of, of uh, students. And they listened happily to the teachings of Sanjaya. And they decided that he wasn't quite giving them all they wanted to know. They said, is this as far as your teaching goes? And he said, yes, it is. So then they set off, uh, determined to travel widely to try to find another teacher. In the course of his travels, um, Upatissa, came to hear about a monk or a man called Asaji, and he went to see this man, Asaji. And he was impressed by Asaji's appearance, by his deportment, the way he behaved. And he said to Asaji, tell me please, whose teaching do you follow? Who is your teacher? And Asaji said, I am a follower of the Buddha. And Upatissa said, please give me a little teaching. What is, what is the gist, what is the essence of his teaching? And Asaji was very modest. He was, in fact, one of the five ascetics with whom the Buddha had practiced self-mortification for the years preceding his enlightenment. And he was also one of the same five ascetics uh, to whom the Buddha preached his first sermon. And
and at the end of the second sermon uh, he had attained enlightenment. So although he was very modest, Asaji was an enlightened being, an enlightened monk, and uh, knew very well what the Buddha taught. But, uh, he was pressed by um, Upatissa to give him just a little taste, what is it that this man teaches? And so he, he said, OK, of things that arise from a cause, the Tathagata, Tathagata is the term used by the Buddha to refer to himself, of things that arise from, the, from a cause, the Tathagata has told the cause. And also, what their cessation is. This is the teaching of the great recluse. This <coughs> was a teaching of such importance. Upatissa understood it to the extent that he became a stream enterer. We have four stages towards reaching enlightenment. And the first stage is stream entry, sotapanna. And just by hearing this brief exposition, Upatissa became a stream enterer. And he thought, wow, now we've found the teacher we really want. So he rushed off and he found his good friend Kolita and said, this is what I've just been taught. And when he repeated this same verse to Kolita, he too became a stream enterer. You may perhaps wonder, well, how come that somebody could attain this particular uh, achievement in such a short space of time. And I think one explanation could be that they were both, uh, both ripe for this level of understanding. It's perhaps a little bit like a chick hatching out of an egg. All you see is the chick breaking through the eggshell and emerging from the egg. What you haven't seen is the development that's been going on inside the egg for days and days beforehand. And perhaps in the same way, Upatissa and Kolita had been developing some level of understanding, and then when they got just the right key, then they could attain this state of stream entry. So they decided that they would go and follow the Buddha, but before that they went back to Sanjaya and said, we are going to go and listen to the words of the Buddha. Would you like to come with us? And Sanjaya said, no. And they said, why not? He's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. You will benefit very greatly. And Sanjaya said, it would be as if a big water tank were to become a small water pitcher, small water jug. I am a well-known teacher. If I go to the Buddha, I will become just like a little water jug. And then he said to Upatissa and Kolita, tell me, who are more numerous in the world, the wise people or the fools? And they said to him, oh, <laughs> wise people are, are few, but fools are very many. So Sanjaya said, OK, let the wise people go to the Buddha, and let the fools come to me, the fool. So he was quite 
straightforward about his, uh, his position. So anyway, that, that is the lead up to Uputisa and Kolita coming to the Buddha and asking for ordination. And they received the monastic names of Sariputta and Moggallana. And they became the two chief uh, disciples. Now this little statement of Asajis may not seem to us to be very significant. Um, of those things that arise from a cause, the Tathagata has told the cause. And he has, and also what their cessation is. That may not sound very important or significant, but actually, this is a very, very important statement. It goes straight to the teaching of cause and effect. Things arise from a cause, and things can also cease when the cause ceases. This is a very brief uh, description of the doctrine we call dependent origination, or paticca samuppada. And this forms part, a big part, of this sutta that we're going to be looking at in a few moments. The importance of right view uh, is very great. The Buddha said, there's a little stanza in the Anguttara in the Kai, he said, I, I know of no such thing so conducive to rebirth in an unhappy plane as wrong view. The Buddha always distinguished between right view and wrong view. And right view is placed at the very beginning of the Noble Eightfold Path. Samaditi is, is there at the beginning. And the Buddha did say um, that it is, the, it is the forerunner of the other states. He says, um, in one of right view, right intention comes into being. So that's the next stage on the Noble Eightfold Path. In one of right intention, uh, right speech comes into being. In one of right speech, right action comes into being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes into being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. And in one of right effort, right mindfulness comes into being. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration comes into being. And in one of right concentration, right knowledge comes into being. So at the beginning of the path, he calls it right view. And now he's brought it in at the very end, right knowledge. It's the same term, samaditi. And with right knowledge, right deliverance comes into being. That's enlightenment. Two very important uh, factors from the Noble Eightfold Path go with samaditi, right effort and right mindfulness. Effort is very important. And if there is no effort, there will be no achievement, no attainment. And mindfulness is what supervises the other factors of the path. It said that right view is like an architect, right effort is the engineer, and right mindfulness <coughs> is the supervisor.
so right view is is the key to developing proper understanding to overcoming our ignorance and to escaping from samsaric existence There are two levels of right view. There's what we call conceptual right view and experiential right view. If you look at the little chart at the, uh, the, at the last of all these sheets of paper you've got, you will, I hope, see there is a distinction made between kinds of right view. Um, conceptual right view is intellectual right view. It is understanding the four noble truths. Understanding them on a theoretical level. It's can be deepened by reflecting on this. And this is the first kind, or the first level, of right view. <laughs> but a deeper level of right view is experiential right view, or penetrating right view. This is when the teaching is penetrated and becomes a matter of one's own experience. The Four Noble Truths are directly understood. And this is a much deeper level, and that is the, the more profound kind of right view. Th this distinction between conceptual and experiential right view is also um, as a second way of describing it, which is very similar. That is mundane and supramundane. And if you look at that, that chart you've got, you will see on the, on the left column, it gives you those two of mundane and supramundane. Now, the mundane level of right view is subdivided into two kinds. The first kind is the understanding of the doctrine of cause and effect in the sense that our actions have effect. Our actions have consequences. Our good actions will produce good results, and our bad actions will produce bad results. At that time, <coughs> and even today, it was not universally accepted that our actions have any effect. There were some um, well-known teachers uh, who had a, a who denied this doctrine. Um, there was a man called Puranakasapa. He said our actions do not have effect. He said you can, if you go along the north bank of the uh, Ganges um, doing acts of charity uh, and praying there will be no accumulated merit from this. On the other hand, if you walk along the south bank of the Ganges, you can kill as many people as you like, and that will have no demerit. That was one point of view. Then uh, Makkali Gosala, he had a doctrine of predestination, that everything is predestined, so it doesn't matter what you do. Again, your good actions won't have any 
effect and your bad actions won't have any effect. You can just carry on in any way you wish. Um, Ajita Kesa Kambala, he had the um, doctrine of materialism, that we are nothing other than our material body, and that on the death of the body, at the breaking up of the body, that's the finish. Nothing goes on, there's no consequences, there's no further life, that's just the complete end of everything. And um, one other man, Kachayana, Pakuda Kachayana, I think his doctrine was called an atomic theory, that um, we have within us an eternal soul, but that soul cannot be damaged or benefited by what we do in our lives. How we act doesn't matter. So these were all people who denied the doctrine of karma in any form. There were also the Brahmin priests. They believed that it was sacrifice which was very important. That the performance of the right kind of rituals, the right kind of sacrifices, they would have beneficial effects. Again, not a question of your own morality, it's a question of uh, you doing the right, or the Brahmin doing on your behalf, the right sacrifice. So there were plenty of people who denied the doctrine of, of cause and effect. But some people who do accept a doctrine of cause and effect may be Buddhists, but you don't have to be a Buddhist to accept that doctrine. And so the first level in that box of uh, right view in a mundane level is open to both Buddhists and non-Buddhists. Not everybody has to be a Buddhist to accept that our actions have effects. Is that clear? Uh, then there is a second level of um, mundane uh, right view, and that is the intellectual understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So this is, of course, only Buddhists will have that level of right view. But as I said, this, this intellectual understanding or this conceptual understanding is a relatively minor degree of right view. And then after that comes the supramundane level of right view, which is the, the second division there. And that is subdivided again, two kinds. The first is a follower of the Buddha who is undergoing training. And the word you'll see in brackets is Seka, S-E-K-H-A. A Seka is someone who is training and has attained the first, one of the first three of the four stages of enlightenment. So you've got the stream enterer, once returner, and non returner. That is the first level of supramundane right view. And then the second level is the Arahant, who has attained full enlightenment. And he is a Seka, not being trained any longer. A is negative, so you've got Seka and a Seka. A Seka means he doesn't need any more training. He's gone beyond training, because he's attained enlightenment. And uh, you see that little star at the foot of the ta that table. That refers to <coughs> The, the understanding of uh, our actions having effects, that I am the owner of my actions 
air of my actions. Actions are the womb from which I have sprung. Actions are my relations, actions are my protection. Whatever actions I do, good or bad of these, I shall become the heir. So that is the distinction between mundane and supramundane <coughs> right view. <coughs> In another sutta, the Buddha says there are two conditions for the arising of right view. The first is parato gosa, that the voice of another. I put that on the board, the gosa. And the second is yoniso manasikara. The voice of another means you need the teaching from someone else. Although we have to acknowledge <laughs> that the Buddha did not have a teacher, so he could develop right view without the voice of another. But <coughs> everybody else needs his voice or the voice of somebody else to help them to understand right view. And the other form of, uh, the other uh, supporting condition is Manasikara, literally turning or making the mind. Yoniso, skillful, turning of the mind, directing the attention in a skillful way. In this way, we can develop our understanding. The opposite is Ayoniso Manasikara, unwise attention. And the Buddha says also there are five factors which we can use to develop right view. They are the practice of uh, sila, virtue. Uh, learning or uh, listening. In those days, of course, there was no written um, written teaching, so it was if you wanted to hear something, if you want to learn something, you have to go and listen to what somebody has to say. Then, discussion, which the Buddha highly recommended. So, so far, you've been doing all the listening to me, but I hope sometime soon we shall have discussion where you develop your understanding by discussing what you think you understand or maybe what you don't understand, and then you learn from that. <coughs> That's the third uh, factor. Uh, the fourth is the practice of samatha meditation, and the fifth is the practice of vipassana meditation. So samatha means uh, tranquility or calming meditation. Um, Vipassana means insight meditation. These are the two main forms of meditation as practiced by Buddhists. Okay, so far? Anybody got a question? Okay. So now Sariputta is going to lay down 16 cases through which it is possible to develop right view. And you will see those 16 on the final page of those notes uh, after you've looked at the table of mundane and supramundane right view. You'll see 16 cases. The first is the wholesome and the unwholesome. The word for wholesome is kusala. The word for unwholesome is akusala. The second case is nutriment or ahara. Thirdly, 
the four noble truths. Though there are four of them, it is considered as one case. And then <coughs> numbers 4 to 15 are 12 causes in the sequence we call dependent origination. Paticca Samupada. And then the 16th one is taints or asavas, defilements, which enter the mind. And in each of these cases, he explains them in the same format. The constituent of the case, its cause, or its arising, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation. It's the same formula to explain all of these as, he, as the Buddha used with the explanation of the Four Noble Truths. Noble Truth of Dukkha, the Noble Truth of the Origin of Dukkha, the Noble Truth of the Cessation of Dukkha, and the Noble Truth of the Path Leading to the Cessation. So we will find the same format used when Sariputta is discussing each of these cases. So you will find that there are certain phrases which appear in each of these um, cases. And I think perhaps the best way is to get started by, um, by starting to read the text. 